right, you bunch of yahoos. Strap yourselves in for another episode of Dan and Don's Toxic Masculinity. In other words, shut up, sit up, and pay attention. Boss, I mean, when's the last time that you and I have actually seen each other? Because I remember, I'm trying to think of the, the uh, network you were working with, because you've worked Inside with several different networks, uh, doing play-by-play, color commentating, and doing different results of uh, fight shows and things of that nature. I yeah. think that's what last time TV. I actually I think so too. saw you was, was, was one of those. Access TV, yeah, yeah. And maybe at an uh, inauguration from some fighter, maybe, uh, at the UFC Hall of Fame, maybe I was there also. Yeah, but I say, I've, I've only ever been to two of those, and that was for either myself or for Don Fry. Otherwise, yep. I don't, uh, I mean, are you... Are, are you still a big fight fan? Do you, do, you, do you follow UFC at all, or do you... I do. I do. I You know, like last weekend was great. Uh, by the way, when you see them getting tired, look at the fighters who are getting tired. What are they doing? Chest breathing. That's chest breathing. Yeah. Wrong breathing. I can change that immediately by simply using the device. But you see, uh, those things I'm looking now at because it's my job. You know, you start picking out, oh, he breathes wrong, he breathes wrong, he breathes wrong. You know, so, uh, yeah, but I enjoy, I enjoy it. I really enjoy it because, you know, in the early days, you were exceptional if you had stamina. And I realized that, thankfully, very fast, and that's why my career went well, because I I'd already did cross-training right away from the beginning. Because a lot of people, they would separate everything. One day they do the striking, then they do wrestling, and then they do uh, ground fighting. I go, no, no, the tri why you're getting tired is the combination. You know, I yeah. always tell people, if you do uh, 50 setups, and now you go try to run on a treadmill, it's gonna be very hard. And now I know why, because all these muscles get tight, you can't breathe using your core. You see now, and that's the same with, Punching and kicking. Punching and uh, kicking is all pushing. Once you're on the ground, it's all pulling. You know, so they're two completely different muscles. So if you train them simultaneously, you will have way better effect. And that's when you get tired. And suddenly, I was, yeah, I had these fights in Japan for 30 minutes. So I needed to be in shape. 30 minutes straight fight, no breaks. That was welcome to Japan, right? And, and, and I found this out on the day of the fight. How funny was, oh, they, first I found out this out. This guy walks up to me and there was no way in. And I thought it was odd. <laughs> and this guy at the day of the fight, because I'm fighting a, a Japanese guy, I thought, oh, you know what? The Japanese are known to be honest people. So he'll be on, wait, wait, wait a minute. What, what was the weight? That's what I was thinking. Why? Oh, but they know my weight. So no way in. So the next day, I, this tall guy walks up to me, 6'3", and he says, I, I, hey, Mr. Balswit, I say, hey, how are you doing? Nice meeting you. I say, oh, you're the promoter. And he goes, no, no, I'm fighting you tonight. I say, you're fighting me? Yeah. I go, what's your weight? And I remember he was 28 pounds heavier than I was. And I go, oh, that, that's weird. And I look at my manager, and then the promoter walks up. I say, oh, you're the promoter? Yeah, I say, He's 28 pounds heavy. You say, oh, no, Mr. Ruther, there's no weight classes. It's open weight. Everybody fights each other. I go, oh, great. So I tried to act myself out of it. And then I asked him, uh, okay, how many rounds are we fighting? Because I thought we'd go like five rounds in three minutes. And he goes, one round. And I go, oh, nice. I was all happy. How many minutes? And he goes, 30. I go, oh, yeah, great, great. I was, But I was completely bluffing yeah. because it was crazy. But because of that... I just needed to work out really freaking hard. So my stamina was always good. I lost a fight in Holland one time because of stamina. And that, uh, you know, the fatigue makes cowards out of men. That was literally, yes. I mean, you get, I mean, you can't defend yourself. And I go, okay, this will never happen to me again. You see, that's why I never uh, thought it was bad to lose. I've ne but yeah, have you ever been down after a loss? I never. I was always, okay, apparently I need to work harder because I lost the fight. That's what I, how I always brought it to my attention but you know a lot of people are destroyed for a week and are crying i go dude learn learn from it get better yeah. better no, technique. I, I totally agree with you that if a loss is really not a loss as, as long as you learn something from it you know because there are a lot of people that they just they just beat themselves up over it and they just it just constantly is on their mind as to why did they lose and uh it's uh it's just a poor element that that they have but as long as you can learn something from it. But uh, I have had one of those matches, just like you said, to where my cardiovascular was gone. And I realized now I'm in deep water. Yep. And uh, I got nothing left in the tank to give. And I, I think it, I'm about to lose a match because this this guy can't carry my jock strap. Yeah. But uh, he has just enough, enough, <laughs> enough left in the tank that's going to outlast me here. And it's sad. I should have finished him off a lot earlier, too, but I, I carried him long too long. And now I'm going to lose to him. That was, that was one of those sad matches to have. Yeah. And you know what? The sad thing now also with the weight cutting, 
a lot of the weight cutting comes from losing into a fight because they always blame it on, they're not blaming it on themselves. They blame it on the fact that his, his opponent cut more weight and he was heavier the day of the fight. Dude, he's four pounds heavier than you. What is that going to do? Is that really so much? I'm not talking about heavyweight being 220 and fighting a guy like Engano. You know, that's a big difference, right? right. But I mean, come on, man. You, you, okay, let's say 10 pounds. What is 10 pounds going to do, really do? Right. Why don't you... Get better shape, get better technique, and fight in your own weight class. Because most of the time when they go down, they're even weaker because now they don't give the body what it deserves. The number second, the number two priority, water. Yeah. <laughs> we're, what, what, we're 98% water, of, what is it, 96? A really high percentage, right? I don't know yeah. what it is exactly, but maybe it's really bad to cut the water out of you. Yeah, yeah like but there's, uh, I'll, I'll say that coming from a wrestling background, there, there are certain uh, universities that they are notorious or just really hard cutting uh, of weight to where, I mean, the guy should probably be, uh, you know, more like a 150 pounder, but he's going to be wrestled at the 125 pound weight class because yeah. he knows he's going to simply bring out the rest of that water. I've actually been to weigh-ins before where the, the couple coaches, they got the fingertips sticking out there, just holding on their athlete because he's literally, he's so weak and he's blacking out standing on the scales and just that fingertip on there is just keeping him just just stable enough to get off that scale, then to put water right back into it. So I'm a big believer that you shouldn't do crazy weight reduction. Uh, again, going back to the United States, uh, yeah, we could learn to tighten up the belt a whole lot more inside the United States, <laughs> United States altogether. Yeah. Here, getting back to what something you were talking about before, uh, but uh, training wise. What, what do you think about what, when it comes to like striking? Because because to me, grappling, you could go 100% grappling. And as long as you know that, once you, I, I was always big about when I was running classes at my training facility of having no injuries. But it's because I was always there barking orders and saying that, you know, when you've got position on somebody, slowly apply pressure, knowing that give this person an opportunity to tap out. Yep. And if they don't tap out, let it go. You know, you got them. Yep. You could, you could break an elbow. You could, you could really hurt him really bad, but, you, but I always go back to, you need workout partners. Yep. Okay. Don't break your toys because then you have no toys to work with because you still need bodies and shapes of all different types of athletes. Because, you know, I always say that 150 pounds could come, in all shapes and sizes, it could be short and thick, like a little fire hydrant. It'd be tall and skinny, like a, like a uh, pole. And most people fall somewhere in between. Some people have necks. Some people have these tree stumps, you know. Yep. You can't choke them because there's no neck to even go after. But when, when it comes to striking, what is your feeling about headgear and, and, and allowing athletes then to still bang the head? Yeah, I think it's stupid. Uh, headgear will still have the impact. It also troubles, uh, makes your vision bad. It, your peripheral is gone. I think it's really dangerous. I think th this is a fun part. I always do this at seminars. You know, people, te somebody gives me a left hook and they do this. This is the defense. Put their hand against their head. And then I stop the class. I say, okay, guys, let me uh, visualize this. I take this focus mitt. I'm going to tape it to my head. And you're going to hit me with a left hook. What do you think is going to happen? You think I, you can knock me out? And everybody starts laughing. And they go, yeah. I go, well, the joke is on you because I see all you guys do this. You, once you make your hand one with your head, it'll go straight through. Now, luckily for us is that if I give if somebody gives me a left hook and I do and I bring my hand up, he automatically takes the power off because he thinks it's not as effective. But if he would be like what I used to do in fighting, I just hit as hard as I can on your defense. Right. I kick as hard as I can on your defense. It goes straight through. You know, so never make yourself a, you wouldn't block a knee like this, right? You block him here. You know how I block knees? I put my mm -hmm. hands on their knees. So they can I don't even let them take off. Simple, right? It's like punching somebody, you stop the punch here. There's no power in there. It's easy to stop. Well, you can do that with knees as well. And especially in MMA, because if they jump guard, yeah, you're going to be in trouble. Having the hands on the knees, you can push them to the side to make sure they don't jump guard. Oh, and yeah, the striking, I, I with striking, uh, it's, about, it's about sparring partners. Every time when I would get injured in, an, uh, in a striking uh, sparring session, it would be against the person 
who was a, a, a beginner or something. So yeah. maybe one of my friends didn't show up, like Amir Perez was really good, Pedro Hizo, Marco, Marco who was already an animal. Marco doesn't know his own power, and yeah. you gotta really watch out because <laughs> yeah. he freaking goes, you know? <laughs> his wife would call me sometimes and, and, and be angry at me because his face was scratched. I said, do you have any idea what your husband does to me? I mean, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm defending myself here. You know, but I had sparring partners, and when I'm sparring, people are on the side who are watching, they go like, oh, we never want to spar with you. But we got zero zero injuries because we know exactly where to stop. I I won't try to knock you out to the head, but to the body I will, and you better do it to me as well. The legs, okay, you want to go hard, but not too hard because you don't want to get injured into a fight, you know. And then the head, it's just once I see there's a, a clear punch, I just take the power off, you know, and I don't really make it. So I never had an injury training with my training partners. It's always when somebody doesn't show up and then I take a student of something. Yeah. And then you know they move weird and you kick an elbow and then the instep and it's always injuries because of that reason. Someone who doesn't know what they're doing. That's yeah. it. It's awkward. It's different than you are. That's why I say always in, sp in, in every uh, aspect of fighting, if you are different, you, you're you gonna win. You're gonna be successful. It, like everybody knows how to land a cross, right? Uh, but but or how to throw across. But to land it, since it's one simple punch, now you're gonna have to figure a way out. Now, if your setup for a cross is a setup that he's never seen before, you're gonna be successful. So be creative, be like a freaking Sakuraba. You know, the double judo chop, what he did, you know? And people go, what is that? That was not doing anything. That was just a distraction for his punch or for a knee bar or for something, you see? That's being creative. That's doing things different than others. And once you start being different than others, because they don't know. You know, if you have a setup, if you train with, a, let's say, a fifth degree black belt in Jiu Jitsu. Now, these guys, of course, they see things coming really good. But if I would be at their level and I have a setup to a triangle choke, for instance, that they never saw, I'm going to catch him with it. Now, I will catch him only once because after that, you know, the, he knows they will never catch him again. But in a fight, that means you just won the fight. Okay. You see? So that's what I say. It's with striking, it's with submissions. Find a setup that they don't know. And once you can do that, you're gonna be victorious. Yep. Just to go back on what you were talking about on the headgear, I'm a big advocator that uh, wearing protective gear so that you don't get hurt, so your, your, your training partners don't get hurt. And I always say that uh, you, you have to know, the, again, that word moderation. You can't go 100% in a practice because you're either gonna hurt your athletes or your athletes are gonna hurt you in the process. And I go, headgear is what it says that it, you put down that headgear, sure, you, they may not cut you. They may not beat up your ears or things yep. of that nature. But that gray matter, each time that you hit hit them, it's going to be sloshed around and sloshed around. And now you're going to have people that uh, Alzheimer's or, or early onset of dementia, things of that nature, because that gray matter is not meant to be uh, sloshed around like that because sooner or later it's going to turn it into pudding. Yeah, 100%. And, uh, and, and also... And no, no, I'm sorry, sorry, keep going. No, I, what I want to say is, you give you, if you have a thick headgear, you just, whatever thickness that is, you give your opponent that more reach. Think about it. Because if my headgear is here and he starts hitting my forehead, well, his punch just became this much longer. So now if I'm using to stay just outside, to, you know how many contact lenses I lost in, during training? There's a lot, because I don't, if they hit me, I try to stay just outside the distance. And sometimes they would always stick on their gloves because they would, my eye would be open and they pull the contact off. I had this at least 10 times happening. Now, if you used to that distance, you know, or, or uh, to a certain distance with the headgear, and then suddenly the headgear is off, now your whole timing is off. We're talking inches. A really good striker who's just outside the reach of his opponent, you know, if he needs to know what the reach of his opponent is. That's why most of the time in the beginning of the fight, when I was fighting, I had my hands low. Because I'm pretty sure if I have my hands here, they're going to hit my head. And the first punch, I let him miss here. And every time I let him come a little closer, and now I found this reach. Now I'm just outside this reach. And that's when I start countering my punches. But if you fight a guy like John Jones, who has an 86 reach, and you never sparred a guy with that reach, and you don't play this game that I just do, you're gonna get knocked out immediately right. because you're simply not used to it. So that's why the thicker the headgear is, the more reach you give your opponent. If they hit, of course, the forehead, because that's how thick it is. Yeah, again, I, I like again, I like the, 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 the sharing of the, the knowledge of how to trade, how to trade safely, because I think there's a lot of athletes that they don't understand this. I think there's a lot of coaches that who never did it 
and they're trying to tell you how to do it. And it's better to, to actually speak to someone who actually has done it. Yep. And they understand what they might have done wrong themselves and how they learn from their own mistakes and how they have made things better for themselves in the process. I was, I always tell people like myself, I was a one trick pony. I was, I was not a striker, but I always said that you have to be within arms reach to punch me. You have to be in uh, legs range to kick knee or elbow. And I was always good about just staying just outside that, that, that range to where now as I bait you to go for things, I simply watch how do most people train. They throw out, they retract right back on it. And as they retract right back in, that's what I move in for the clinch, yep. the takedown, or jamming them up against the uh, cage wall. Because yep. the moment that they clinch, and I would say that, don't take my words, don't take Dan Severn's words for it. I go, watch all these combat sports. Watch boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai, Karate Kung Fu. They all have a referee. And each time that these guys start to go out there and throw their spinning back kicks or spinning back fists or punches, they all get entangled somehow into a clinch. Yep. And the mist, that, that striped shirt individual comes out there and goes, no, no, separate up their fellows or, or ladies. We don't have that in this huggy, squeezy type of stuff taking place. We're here to watch people punch, kick, knee, or elbow. And I always tell people that I was just good about getting those clinches, takedowns, or jam up that's cage wall because I neutralized 90 plus percent of their arsenal. And they and they should listen to you. You say, don't take my words for it, but if you look at your record, you've been very successful in, with it, you know? That's how I got better in everything I do. I just steal from others. Mike Tyson, yes. oh, why does he hit so hard? He has an open stance. That's why he can generate more power. Oh, but you're only an open target here. Yeah, but that's the only downside. Plus, all the fighters that I know who stand like that, nobody ever went down to the body. Well, if I'm so easy to hit to the body, why don't you drop me to the body? You see what I mean? But we all are, in our minds, we are all programmed to listen to a certain person and, and to automatically believe that. That's what you see now also going on in politics, so to say. Yeah. But look, I, I was one time teaching a seminar, and I was talking about my stance, and there was a famous fighter was sitting there. And he said, boss, from now on, I'm going to fight like you. Unbelievable. He says, but one thing. He says, if I bring my, uh, because I don't rotate my punch. I keep it straight. And if it comes naturally, I let it come naturally. But if I tell people to, to twist their hands, they start doing it here already. That's telegraphing. Yeah. To me, if I see your elbow move, you some punches coming. This will have a way better penetrating. And this uh, just simply comes from, uh, from karate because it penetrates easier. If you have a target here and the elbow is up, you, know, you ricochet to the side already if you hit it. See what I mean? But if you, go, if you keep your elbow low, it goes straight through. So it's better penetration. And if it comes naturally again, do it. So he said, okay, everything I believe, he says one thing. Look, this is my hand. And if I twist my hand, look, I'm covered. And I go, and I, I do this. I say, you mean like this? And he goes, shit. Because now my hand is straight and I still have my jaw covered. You see what I mean? But because somebody told him that, he automatically assumed that is the only way to bring the shoulder up. Well, I can simply twist, twist my hand and do exactly the same thing. You see, so I always thought outside the box. The thing with me is also I didn't have coaches. You know, I, I had a coach for general work and for, for striking I had coaches, but I didn't have coaches for submissions. And I just was a little different. That's why I was effective, because I was, again, different than other people. Nobody told me to do it a certain way, just like everybody does. And I, I thought, hey, maybe if I do it like this, it's maybe for more effective. And what do you know? Suddenly it works. You see, again, it's just being different. Yeah, no, that's one of the things I like about when it comes to uh, rolling. Yeah, what if you go through all your training type exercise at a normal workout, then you get to the point that to, that you're doing some uh, live rondori or something, whatever you want to call it. I just say it, it's just live goals, but it's kind of like going, I would say that you're doing 100% submission grappling, but then you're doing simulated striking so that you might be you might be grappling around. All yep. of a sudden you go up into like like a hammer fist. Yep. But, but, but I always try to tell my guys, verbalize it. Yep. But then go through the mechanical so that you're incorporating as many of the senses as possible and you get used to, you know, say, as your grandpa was a hammer fist and you go up there and you go to touch it, you re the guy realized, who he, he, he just, uh, he just hammer fist your face right there, but he knows that you got to go back to work tomorrow. Yep. He's being kind to you right now. And uh, that was, uh, that, that was a, uh, the hard part because some of the athletes, 
did not understand percentages nope. whatsoever. No, zero. And, and by, by the way, rolling, that's the thing that I miss the most, pretty much. Because the, the, the submission game is one of those games that you will never master. It's there's always something every workout you go like oh man that was cool I never I never realized yeah. it it's a little thing but it's always right you always something new pops up and that's what I loved about submission you you never you can never master it because it's endless the combinations you know and then the setups and all that kind of stuff so yeah unfortunately with my knees uh, I can do it for one training and then the next five days I'm going to be in some serious pain so I decided not to do that anymore. Oh, here, I'll, I'll recommend something to you. Have you ever heard of uh, DMSO? No. Well, just, just write those initials down, DMSO, because it'll, it'll be something that you want. It, it, again, it's a phenomenal anti-flam. DMSO. DMSO, yep. I first learned about it at the Olympic Training Center back in 1976. All right. Colorado Springs. So... And uh, if, a, if a trainer is going to recommend it, I mean, obviously they know all the yeah. stuff that's uh, that you cannot put into your body because they don't want you testing positive on any. If, if you have to be, you know, blood tests stuff like that have to come in. But uh, DMSO, it's it's a it's a great anti-flam. Perfect. So just, just, just there. At least at least I was, I was able to offer you up something new there for you there, boss. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you see no, me you, over. I get you, <laughs> you'll you you'll you'll like it there too. Like I said, it will it will do the body good, and you'll be really impressed with the uh, with what you're doing. Thank you for watching another episode of Dan and Don's Toxic Masculinity. You better like, subscribe, and share, or I'm gonna come to your house.